coming live from an airstream somewhere in Tornado Alley, bringing you the people, places, and stories from the Panhandle to the Red River. This is your only in Oklahoma show. And welcome to the show. Today we're not eating anything, we're not going anywhere. We're going to sit back, chill, and listen to the the magic that is the Imaginaries. Just a little old two-piece band right out of Oklahoma. I'm Brett. And I'm Harley. So I did some research on this music that we're going to be hearing today, these people <laughs> that we're going to be talking to. And let me tell you, they've been everywhere. It's a real honor, actually. Yeah. I, I feel uh, for them for them to uh, you look at, come, okay. on our, come on our tiny little show. Well, you let's compare resumes, can we? Uh <laughs> I followed my dream for oh a hot minute, but they their resume is everything from Disney to Grand Funk Railroad. Yeah, I I agree, but let's. Let I them, feel like yes, they're great. Are you going to do that cliche thing where you say, "Well, let's let the music do the talking"? Is that what? <laughs> You know no, I, mean? I was. I feel like we're doing interview stuff before right, the we're interview. Doing, right. So I, I really wanted to we're coming in hot, as I said. <laughs> right. Go ahead. I wanted to point out that we have been highlighted in we a have very been. cool place. In a very cool place that we may or may not have eaten at recently. Absolutely. Yes, Decentios in Marlow, uh-huh. Oklahoma. Yeah. Paid us the honor of putting us on their menu. Yeah. Their huge chalkboard menu. Right. We're right in the middle of that. We've come a long way from having locations cast shade (laughs) on things that we've done to actually shining a spotlight. But we had some, we had some help, to be fair. We did have some help. This is a a huge shout shout out to our listeners. We've had uh, a few people. Yeah. Go to Decentios and tell him that they're there because of us. And one couple bought Everything on the menu. Now, here's the thing. I don't know who you are. I, I, you know, a lot of people go, oh, they're just making it up for the show. No, this is a real thing. This really happened. They, they Decentio- went and bought one of everything on the menu. I think that's one awesome. Of everything. And there's a lot of really good everything's on the menu. Yes, I agree a hundred percent. Anyway, we were super pumped about yeah. that. So whoever you are, let us know. Shoot us over an email, only an okay show at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. I think we should probably get to our interview. Right. Coming up, we've got Maggie and Shane from the Imaginaries. Stick around. With all of the changes in the tax credits Mm -hmm. and the stimulus payments that have been thrown about, I feel like people really need to get a real good grasp on what they're going to be doing for their 2020 taxes. Right. To be fair, there is no immunity against taxes either. We don't have, there's no vaccine that's going to help you avoid paying your taxes. Absolutely not. Taxes aren't going away at all. As much as we would love to think that the IRS is just going to take, sit the next play out, <laughs> right? The IRS is going to take one for the team. Right. I am not, I do not believe that mm-hmm. that is on the schedule. So I think that if you have concerns about your taxes, right, that you need to reach out to Holiday Tax Group. For a free 30-minute consultation. Look, since 2010, they've been doing everything, taxes, balancing everybody's books. Also, if you're a military personnel or a teacher, you get 20% off. And, heck, you get a free 30-minute consultation. Right, and you can get that by calling them at 405-730-3100. Or you can catch them at HolidayTaxGroup.com. That's Holiday with two L's. Well, the Imaginaries is an American band formed right here in the plains of Oklahoma. The bluesy rock husband and the bluesy rock gospel (laughs) revival wife duo. Okay, I'm doing it. Duo came together in 2018, and uh, let me tell you, it's music therapy. I'd like to welcome. It is such an honor to have Shane and Maggie from the Imaginaries. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. So I have a question for you two. How do you go from the very small town of Verdon or even the relatively larger college town of Norman to singing the national anthem at Madison Square Garden? Oh, man. It's, I think it's a lot of blind faith, really. It's just, <laughs> we both just discovered, I think, at an early age that we wanted to do this and uh, kind of put our mental thoughts in that direction of failure not being an option. And it's amazing. Like I would have never actually 
I don't think either of us sort of planned that happening, but it just kind of happened. And it's been a really cool, it's a really cool experience. Yeah, it was, you know, that opportunity came from a series of other opportunities. It was such an incredible experience to get to do that. We did the national anthem and the official halftime show, which was a wow. blast. So. <laughs> So Shane, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna ask. And nothing. You know, we're from the same kind of. We work in the same area as Verdon, but we pass through Verdon. Really? There's not. Yeah, we're 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 in Chickasha. We're in Chickasha. So we're we're okay. con- we're country cousins to Verdon. And yeah. driving through Verdon, how did I'm not saying how did you get out of Verdon? What was the? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that. I don't mean that in a terrible way. But Verdon is a that. very small town. I really discovered music when I was 12. I mean, like as far as my dad took me to see B.B. Uh, King and Tom Petty in the same summer. Wow. It was the B.B. King Blues Festival in uh, 96 or 97 in, in Tulsa. And I got to hear B.B. King, Buddy Guy, and Bonnie Raitt live. And a young young guy by the name of Kenny Wayne Shepherd opened. And he was, you know, kind of uh, probably four or five years older than me, but, you know, a young guy that was playing blues. And it was, like, so inspiring because I was like, wow, he can do that. I can probably do that as well. And, I mean, I was so blown away by by B.B. King and just just the whole show was just like, you know, you, you I grew up in a in a very musical family and was always listening to music. But I think that was a really pivotal moment for me in wanting to uh, become a musician. So obviously being from Verdon, there's there was no music in Verdon. You know, there was no music in our school. I mean, we had sports and, and we had agriculture or what is it, FFA, uh, right. you know, you, those are your options discovering music you know i immediately just sort of started begging my parents for a guitar when i was 12 13 and and just kind of dove straight into becoming a musician and and by the time i was 16 i was you know already playing in clubs around around oklahoma and and starting to play outside of oklahoma texas arkansas kansas city and um started building up my following and of course put my first record out when i was 17 and then um was signed by a manager and that's what pulled me out of Verdon. I moved, I graduated, I actually technically graduated high school in Chickasha. Oh. I went to Verdon until my junior, to my junior year. And then because there was this like sort of block scheduling that Chickasha had, I realized that I had, I, if I, if I transferred to Chickasha, I could graduate in January and I wanted to get to Minneapolis. So I transferred my senior year to Chickasha and I graduated early. And in in June of 2002, I moved up to Minneapolis and started my music career there. I was signed by a manager, and that pulled me out of Verdon real fast. <laughs> wow. <laughs> if, if you don't mind, Shane, for just a second, let's switch back to Maggie. Maggie, your resume is kind of ridiculous. I'm just going to say I got tired reading your resume. How did you get to where you are now? Is it a similar story oh to Shane? Oh my goodness. Thank you for, for saying that. You know, I started piano when I was five years old and I always had a super strong connection to music. I started writing songs when I was in elementary school and I was that odd child that loved to practice all the time. And I was in a few bands in high school. And I was actually in an all-girl band, and we had a, our monthly gig at Borders Bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I I just got more into it and started writing more, performing more. I was in church performing as well, um, leading worship, and that really helped, helped me develop my skills playing with other people. I recorded my first album when I was a senior in high school, but it wasn't really... It was, you know, kind of a, a one taker. So I brought my, my high school band in there and we recorded and we played the songs down, you know, just all together, basically one take. And that, that was my first CD. I actually went to OCU and studied music business. And it was my freshman year there when I decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make my first, you know, very professional album. So I found a producer to work with in the Dallas area and, um, went down there and, and did that. And that was an incredible experience, very eye opening to see the possibilities and to hear my songs transform into what they became in the recorded versions. And after that, it was crazy without a lot of effort. Honestly, at that time, a lot of those songs actually 
every single one on that on my self-titled debut album was getting licensed um, on different TV shows. And that is a lot harder to do now. But at that time, it was a little bit easier to get into. But yeah, I, I would say just for both of us, it's been just a series of events and opportunities and blessings along the way, for sure. In an industry that traditionally, especially with younger artists, has a tendency to chew people up and spit them out, you guys have just continued to fight the adversity of the music industry, the entertainment industry. What has been the secret? Was there ever, and you guys can answer this separately, has there ever been a moment where you're like, you know what, I would just rather go home. <laughs> I would rather do anything else but this. Oh, that's, I'm not going to lie, I've felt that many a times, and of course, I feel like I've been chewed up and spit out multiple times, but you know, I always get back up and keep going. Um, I think that's the key, really. The first thing that comes to mind as far as that was concerned is in 2003, I got the opportunity to tour with B.B. King, and I, it was my first national tour, which is so ironic, being that he was one of the uh, people who inspired me to, to become a musician. And that's amazing. I moved to Minneapolis, and my management company, of course, this wasn't something that I was able to sort of make happen on my own, but at that time, my management company was working with a lot of blues artists. They, they managed Buddy Guy and Double Trouble and Johnny Lang and, mm -hmm. and Susan Tedeschi, and so... They uh, they said, hey, we've got a great opportunity for you. We, we sent your stuff to the promoter that, that does the BB King Festival Tour. And they'd like to have you come out and do like the opening set. So I was just playing clubs around Minneapolis and sort of figuring out how to be a musician and, and grow and, and just getting to work with some just incredible monster musicians in Minneapolis. And so you know, I, I was grinding it out, you know, and then this opportunity came and it was just unbelievable. I got to do 30 I think it was around 35 shows nationally, wow. including the Hollywood Bowl. And I was 21 at the time. Jeez, so um, as you can imagine, it was just like, it was just this, wow. You know, 20, I think I turned 21 mid midway through the tour. I will tell you this. We came off the tour and I remember, oh, I, I just remember it to this day. We came off the tour. I got back to Minneapolis where I had to, you know, quit my job to go on this tour. And uh, I remember going into the office and speaking with my manager and, and, ho and like basically saying, you know, it's time to settle up on, on payment. And he's like, well, so we pretty much broke even on the tour. And I'm like, what? You know, um, and so I, I was gone for three months on a tour that I made no money on and uh, I couldn't pay my rent. So I uh, literally got home from the weekend of the final shows was that the final show on the tour was at the Hollywood Bowl. The next week I was back in Oklahoma working for my dad plumbing. And so talk about a, uh, Man. you know, a, a, total like a huge uh pill to swill there and uh and try to keep your head up you know in that scenario is just it was super hard but but i did you know but that's that's one thing that comes to mind that is amazing yeah. i mean you were on tour with at 21 with bb <laughs> king not getting paid etta james and george yeah. thoroughgood and you came home yeah. empty-handed empty-handed i mean and we and we had like a line at the merch booth it's just like you know, looking back on that, like obviously somebody was sticking money in their pocket, but I'm not going to blame it on my management. I think it was more of the promoter of the actual tour because I heard after the fact what he would do is he would tell artists that they were getting paid like $500 for the opening slot, but really he was billing the uh, the festival for like you know 2,500 or you know three grand or something like that, and then he was sticking the money in his pocket. And uh, I can't prove it, but I I was heard that that's that's what happened after the fact, but. The music business is not a bit, it's just, it, you have to, you have to have this never ending thirst to get back up and keep going because man, it'll beat you down. This path that we've chosen or, you know, really the, the path has chosen us is anything but easy. And yeah. after being rejected constantly, I mean, that, that wears on anyone, you know, what may be even worse than that is getting no response from people. And mm. we get that a lot as well. Um, just nothing. It's hard because we have to keep that hunger and excitement about what we're doing and not let the rejection or the past experiences like sort of jade you from from opportunities that are right in front of you. You yeah. know what I mean? Because you can let you can let all that frustration and disappointment sort of get you jaded to the point where you're just you're you kind of numb down and you don't realize that there's still opportunity, man. Mm -hmm. There's always opportunity. Right. And you just got to keep looking for it. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, one thing I've learned, it's kind of sad, but 
trying not to get too excited about something until it's actually happened because up until that point, it's still up in the air. There's a chance that it may not actually come through. And so that's something I've really had to work on is even though maybe I've been given an opportunity or we've been given an opportunity, I'll plan for it, but I'm not going to like get so excited about it that if it, if it doesn't happen, it's not going to be the end of the world because that has happened before. I don't know if you guys are aware, but a, a more recent experience that we've gone through together is last year, Shane had an emergency appendectomy and had a horrible five month recovery. And during that time, we were working tirelessly on trying to book us a holiday tour. Um, we specialize in, in Christmas music around the holidays. And Shane said, hey, Maggie, why don't you uh, try to get us on an opening slot for a Christmas tour? Because it's such a specific thing. There's not a ton of artists really seeking that out. Mm-hmm. It's something that we do. So I did that. I found the managers for all these different artists that were going on tours and releasing Christmas albums, which isn't the easiest thing to find in June and July. (laughs) But I found these people, I contacted them. And to my surprise, I got a response from every single person. It was very encouraging. Most of them said, we're not having support, but thanks for writing. Good luck. Um, mm-hmm. And then a couple of them said, hey, we'll, we'll keep you in mind. Thanks for reaching out. And mm-hmm. I was like, wow, well, that's pretty cool. You know, a couple months went by. And then one day we got an email and it was Brian Susser's management. And they said, oh. hey, can you guys talk today? We said, yes, call us whenever you need to call. So we had a call and his management, it was so funny. It was like the strangest conversation. They're like, okay, so are you guys? partiers and we're like, uh no they're like okay so is this going to be pretty easy is it just going to be you know the two of you are you married like what's the deal is there going to be drama and <laughs> they're asking all these questions and we we're like you know we're married it's just going to be us as a duo like what are we even talking about right now like what is going on and he was like okay well we'd like to offer you guys to open for the entire tour are you available for the 25 dates because we don't really wow. want to get like two acts yeah do it all we'd just rather have we'd rather just have one act do it all yeah and what was so interesting is that is that at the same time that this was all happening i had a really good friend courtney from minneapolis who who works for she's a joss stone's uh, tour manager and oh, it is in the her. business yeah. and she yeah yeah and so courtney had actually she, courtney knew scott over at Surf Dog, who is Setzer's label and management, and had actually sent him our record, sort of just as a, as a friend. She said, "I'm going to send Scott your record because I think he would dig it, and maybe they might want to sign you guys or something." You know, so we actually weren't sure what we were getting ready to talk about. We weren't sure if they were like into the Imaginaries, wanting to like work with us as far as the label's concerned, or what was actually happening. So we were on this phone call, just kind of blindsided, and and uh, sure enough, it was just this, this email that Maggie had sent out just because she wanted to see if she could just because, open up an yeah. opportunity. And, and, and it worked yeah. and it was amazing. We, we booked it and this was the beginning of October. The first date was November 15th. So not very much time to get ready for it, but they told us, Hey, you know, you guys are going to sell a ton of merchandise. You're going to need a tour manager. You're going to need all these things. So make sure you stock up and have everything you need. So we did. We bought thousands of CDs, hundreds of t-shirts, got all the stuff. We hired a tour manager. We rented a Sprinter van from Nashville. There weren't going to be any nights that we could actually stay in a hotel. We were literally going to have to drive after each show to the next one to be there in time for sound check. Wow. So we had all this planned. And two days before the first show, uh, which was in Minneapolis, Brian's management sent us an email and they said, Hey guys, I'm so sorry. I don't know how else to tell you this, but the tour is not happening. You know, all the contracts had been signed, everything, which by the way, unfortunately we did not put in there that we would get paid no matter what. (laughs) Oh, that is a lot of cost to absorb. (laughs) Oh my gosh. So that, that's probably the most gut punch that I've ever experienced 
honestly. And so. just just to set this up a little more, like we had, like Maggie said, we had rented the Sprinter van, and we were actually literally packed. And we were actually already on the road to Minneapolis, which the first date was two days away. And so we had left. And um, she actually found out about the tour cancellation from a Twitter post. Yeah. And um, and then and she was like, you know, we didn't even actually get a call until at that after. moment. So after it was about an hour after when it was when it was public that management called and told us that. So it was it was rough. It's yeah. like fun. That's so like finding we, out your girlfriend is single on Facebook because she updated <laughs> her status. You're like, wait a second. Totally. So, it, I mean, it, I, I would think it's a similar similar thing. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, honestly, it's like as an as a creative person, it's like it's so hard to get an opportunity like that. It's so hard to get somebody to just stop and give you a chance right, and take a chance like that. And once you and, and to get a chance that's so great like that that we would have we know we would have gone out there and slayed it and made a lot of fans and it would have opened doors for us. But to get that opportunity taken away it sucks man. so kind of really back, my next thing is you know some years ago chris stapleton we all know he's a great songwriter somebody asked him look you could have stayed home collected mailbox money why would you want to go out on the road and take the chance he said because i want to hear them cheer for me and my song i just yeah. man that's got to be daunting to think about putting yourself on the line like that it, why not? Why not just sit home and write jingles or write songs and sell them to Florida Georgia Line? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for us, we're just, it's just who we are. We're artists. We love songwriting just as much as we love performing. Um, we love recording just as much as we love writing. It's all equally, I mean, for me at least, and I think for Shane too. I don't know. I, I still think the magic is in the live performance and, yeah. and the connection with your fans, you know, and that's really what drives you to want to do this more because there is no, like, you can't describe that feeling, that high that you get from playing a great show with yeah. great musicians and, and, and to a crowd that, that appreciates and loves the art you're creating, you know? Yeah, for well, sure. So I totally get, I totally get why Stapleton wanted to do that because you know, he can write great songs that, you know, that all these country, bro country guys cut, but right. it's not as, it's, it's a different, it's a different feeling, man, when you're on stage and you, you know that people are connecting to you, you know, and what you're doing. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a unique thing. Yeah. There's really nothing like it, but yeah, throughout all this stuff that's happened to us, I mean, it obviously gets us down for a little while and then we decide to get back up and let's see what else we can do. And you know what? It fuels us to know that we've gotten these opportunities ourselves and we can do it again and we can do something bigger than what we did before. It's not easy at all, <laughs> but I think it's just who we are. We're just very driven and passionate. And like I said, the music has called us, so we well, will follow. I don't know the best way to put this. I've done a, quite a bit of digging into your music and it almost seems like without the struggles that you have met along the ways, your music seems to have like a a quality to it where, you know, real life has to have played a role in your lyrics, the soulful nature of, of the music. I, I really feel like you kind of had to run into some some uh, hard knocks to, to get to where you're at. Right. You can't write the blues unless you've been in through the blues. You know what I mean? That's the truth. That's the, that's the truth. I mean, I think that you can, you can put any emotion in the music, but for sure there's been a, um, there's been a theme of struggle and perseverance in our music and especially, you know, my solo stuff leading up to starting the Imaginaries. I mean, I had a record called Beauty and the Struggle, which is, you know, I mean, it says it all. It's like you got to find that beauty in, 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 uh, in struggling as a musician and, and we've put a lot of energy in, into songs like that and just songs about keeping the faith and, and keeping, keeping on believing in what you know you're meant to do in life. And I, I think we write those songs because we really need to hear that ourselves. You know what I mean? It's like as much as we know that that is a message that other people need to hear as well, it's like we really need to hear it too. So, um, there's a lot of those type of songs on the, that are going to be on the debut, uh, Imaginaries record, um, as well. Yeah. And even though there is a lot of struggle, in our songs, we always try to be encouraging and relatable as well for the listeners and always try to leave them with a glimpse of hope. That's our goal. Your music video, Revival, for starters, you've got a lot of Oklahoma in there 
But secondly, it's one of those things where if you watch it, you the hair it, stands yeah. up on your neck. You feel like it. you guys really have conveyed a a certain set of emotions into really a what three and a half minute long video. Yeah, I uh, appreciate you saying that because that was exactly what our our intentions were going into that. Yeah, we decided that we had to do a pretty epic video for this song. Um, and honestly, once we had written the song, we kind of knew this is a very special song. And we immediately started dreaming up what the video is going to be like. And that process um, of recording, we went to Muscle Shoals and recorded the album. And that was, I believe, the first song that we tracked. Um, and it definitely had something special going on in the studio. Some magic was captured for sure. Well, and, Muscle Shoals is, uh, is a magic. I mean, that's that's big time. That is that's hallowed ground. <laughs> it really is. It is. It really is. You know, Maggie and I probably would have never had that opportunity had it not been for our good friend Devin Powers in, in Los Angeles, who he's a he's an incredible musician and, and a composer and and a, a real dear friend of ours. He had connected us with a friend of his. Uh, from the Bay Area by the name of John Cunaberti. And John is an incredible producer and engineer and has worked with just tons of fantastic artists through his career. And he started this thing called the One Mic Series. And he had done so many things throughout his career that he had had a conversation over coffee with some other recording engineers about recording a full band with one microphone and making it sound great. He sort of started on this quest as like a dare, you know, and so he decided that he was going to find musicians and he was going to go record them in legendary studios around the country. And he was going to start sort of this thing called the One Mike series and, and make it be like a YouTube series. And, and his son is a, is a uh, filmmaker. So we got asked to be a part of this and it was just, it fell out of, fell out of nowhere. At that time, we had just started stockpiling songs for this project and we've been talking about it for a while. We were both sort of kind of at the point where we felt a little bit, maybe a little bit exhausted from just the struggle of our solo careers. You know, I was coming sort of off the record and Maggie as well. And and uh, we we had songs that we had written that, that didn't fit those projects and, and stuff that maybe we co-wrote with other artists and we kind of liked for ourselves. And so anyways, we got asked to do this thing in, at the, in Muscle Shoals and at that time, we didn't even know what the band was called. We just went down there and we got to experience this whole process, which was us showing up in Muscle Shoals, uh, connecting with some studio musicians. We connected with the great David Hood, who plays, played bass on every, you know, Muscle Shoals recording you've ever heard of from, from Aretha to all the greats. And so we, we had a band, you know, we got down there, we had a band and, and we rehearsed with them the day we showed up. And then we went to the studio and recorded this. We did two songs. It was a magical thing. It was just so cool to, you know, show up, meet these musicians, walk into a studio. Um, we rehearsed, you know, for like an hour and then we were ready to go. And we, we, we played our songs down around one microphone and, and, and even they had never done something like this too. So this was all a new experience for them and they're very seasoned. Uh, the guitar player, Kelvin Holly toured with Little Richard for 25 years and, you know, he, he, he's played with everyone, you know? So, I mean, these guys. So they're season playing session music guys. Just, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So it takes, it takes a special thing for them to get super excited. And so we went in there and they loved our songs. So that really made us excited to begin with. And then we cut them around one microphone and it took a little while to set up the session, you know, because essentially where our placement of our amps and, and, and the volumes that we had in the room, that was sort of the mix. And so it took a little little while to get it right. And then we went ahead and recorded. And I'll never forget walking into the control room and, and the guitar player, Kelvin, saying, man, he would walk up to Johnny. He's like, man, I don't know what kind of voodoo you've got going on, but man, that's incredible. And it, and it sounded amazing. So that whole experience of doing that is what started the, the Imaginary. Yeah. And it prompted us to go back there to record the album. We got to work with a lot of the same musicians on that. And it was a very fun, easy, awesome experience. Back to Revival, the song and video itself. We wrote the song with our friends Stephen Goss and Nathan Angelo when we went out to Nashville for a trip, and we all felt like it was really something special. 
We've been working with a director here in Oklahoma, Reagan Elkins, out of Chickasha. He's done our recent music videos for the Imaginaries. He's done all the Imaginaries music videos so far. And we told him, we said, hey, you know, we have this idea. We want to do something that's, oh, brother, where art thou kind of inspired with a Bonnie and Clyde vibe. And he was like, oh, my gosh, okay, that's amazing. I totally am game for that and so we told him a bunch of our ideas and and then we told him our budget and we're like can you make this happen for this little amount of money like let's figure it out so it's been really great to work with him and figure out how to make these pretty awesome videos for an affordable rate and do it here in Oklahoma we actually have not filmed anything outside of the state with him so there's a lot to work with here you're right. There's a lot of Oklahoma in Revival. We we filmed, we actually filmed a tiny bit in Chickasha. We filmed in Enid for the, our saloon scene and the train scene. And There's then we some filmed... Medicine Park in there, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Lots, of, lots of Medicine, medicine Park, Park in Wichita Mountain. Yeah. yeah. So we are really proud of how the video turned out. And it's actually like a almost seven minutes. It's a, really a short film. We added some dialogue at the beginning and really wanted to have a, an art piece that we were all really proud of. And I can say, you know, we definitely are all very proud of how it's turned out. And we've been submitting it to film festivals. And so far, it's been selected for three across the world. Wow. Um, so that's very cool. It means a lot to us, but other people think it's great, too. So. Well, Shane, you're a little, to me, you're, you kind of remind me of a, a young Dickie Betts and Maggie, you kind of have an Allison Cross quality. How do you make, how do you bring those two? You have two distinctive styles that seem to just melt together. There's those harmonies and just the tone and the arrangement. How does it, tell me, give me the, the secret sauce. Well, there is no secret sauce because I think that you have to kind of back up and realize that early collaborations between the two of us when we first started dating were, it wasn't easy. Because our styles were so different. But um, around 2009, Maggie started working with a college booking agent. She uh, was going to start booking shows at colleges. And, and so they started pitching her for all these shows. And she booked a like a national tour of doing like 35 or 40 colleges all across the you know country. And, and she didn't want to go on tour by herself. So she said, hey, can you come play guitar? And I said, sure. I'll, I, think, I think I can. Maybe. I don't know. We'll figure it out. And so I did. And that was sort of the beginning of the two of us collaborating musically because we really had not experimented with any songwriting. Our stuff was really separate, you know, at that time. And right. and I think that honestly, what has led led us to this road is just years of playing together. You know, you can't. There's no. There's no like secret formula for that. Right. You just have to do it. And the more you do it, the more you connect. The more you sort of learn the other person's tendencies, and you get tight. And so uh, we went on these college tours and that, that sort of lasted us for about three years until we moved out to LA. And, and I think during that time, that was where we really started like getting tied as musicians with one another and, and, you know, vice versa. Maggie would come out and play keys sometimes when I have a solo show and sing backgrounds. And, and for me, it was like, I'd never sang harmony before. Like Mm -hmm. when I started playing with her as a guitar player, I was, that was like all brand new. Like this is a whole new world, you know? I was like, what is harmony? You know, I'm I'm (laughs) the lead singer. I don't, I don't have to sing harmony, you know? And so she kind of really schooled me on that. And she, she was really natural at it because she had done it in church growing up. So I think that sort of that history of us just playing together way back then sort of made this transition into imaginary made it feel like it fit you know what i mean mm-hmm. um because we had that history of playing together and, and that's really i think you know the secret to it all yeah. Maggie, what's your take man we've done it a lot i totally agree and you know the first things that we did together were christmas songs we released a few yeah. christmas songs under maggie mcclaire and shane henry christmas has its own vibe so mm-hmm. it it totally works our goal with our christmas songs has always been for something to be timeless and classic and just to have that Christmas sound, you know, and not to sound like it was made in any certain time period or really be genre specific, but just be super accessible for the holidays for anyone. That really started it as far as recording together. And then, of course, um, I would sing backgrounds on his records. He would play guitar on mine. He would, and we would collaborate 
recording um, as well as writing with each other for our solo project. So we'd sit down and we'd say, okay, today we're going to write a, a song for Shane's new album. Okay. Which we didn't start doing until around, what, 2014-ish? Probably. Yeah, that, that round in there. Maybe, your, well, time is on, your time is on record, yeah. Right. Yeah, probably more like 2012 or something. But yeah, I mean, it's it's been a very natural thing that's happened. And like Shane said, at first, our writing styles and our musical styles were just so different. It didn't really work at first, but we just knew that it was worth figuring out. And so hundreds and hundreds, if not <laughs> thousands of shows later, here we are. And, you know, we've played so many shows together as a duo, not just because we want to play as a duo, but also, I mean, just due to logistics, due to traveling, due to budget. We love to play with a band, but 90% of our performances have been as a duo. We've really learned how the other one works. We learn to really listen to each other. This experience of the Imaginaries has been really exciting because it's been new for us. It's also been a challenge because instead of one of us being the front person and making the decisions or leading the band, now we're both doing that. And so it's been interesting to figure out how that works as well. Ultimately, a bunch of people at every show before the Imaginaries was formed would say, I want this CD with both of you on it. <laughs> and we're like, well, I... I have five records and Shane has five records and then we have a Christmas album and they're like, uh, I want, I want to hear you guys together. Can you just <laughs> record something like you sounded tonight? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. oh. but, and this happened, this happened at every show at least once. We had this thought in the back of our minds forever that we were, we wanted to do something together, but the thought of doing something brand new was honestly just like, oh, terrifying to start completely over. Once we just decided to do it, we jumped in and it's been so exciting. Like I said, it's been fresh. It's been fun for us, which I think, like Shane said, we kind of got exhausted trying so hard with our solo careers, which we're still going to keep putting music out under our solo names as well. This has been a really natural thing that's happened. And these songs just came to be. They weren't forced at all. Um, the style wasn't forced at all it's just a nice combination i guess that probably wouldn't have existed if it weren't for us coming together so are you guys just like huge fans of unicorns and gnomes where's the name imaginaries come from oh man that's a funny story so after we did this one mic series we didn't have the band name john reached out and he said hey uh, we've got the video edited for the one mic and we're going to release it next week on YouTube. What do we title this as? Leading up to that, we've been really kind of brainstorming, working hard on on trying to just figure out what we were going to call our, our band. And, and, you know, the idea of it just being Shane and Maggie to us felt a little too sort of country or bluegrass. And we just said, you know, there's a lot of bands that are like duos that just go by their first names. And, and just like Matt and Kim and memorable. stuff like that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It just felt like an easy cop out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we started just brainstorming. We had like a, a storyboard of ideas and names. And, and then we would go to our, our music attorney and we're like, hey, is this, you know, check and see if this is taken. And then we'd find out that the band in Sweden already had that name and it was copywritten or whatever. And Damn so it was kind of a frustrating. <laughs> hilarious. I mean, it's like you think about how many people are on this earth, like everything's taken, you know. Right. I was like, man, I don't know how we're going to find something, but it'll eventually come. I'm totally honest. I had a dream. This was right towards the wire of needing to get something to John. And in the dream, we were playing on stage. We had a sign behind us that said the Imaginaries. I guess it just came from sort of my imagination and <laughs> need to figure this out. And this was there. It landed. So I woke Maggie up in the middle of the, uh, at three in the morning or something and said, I think I know what the band name is. I think, I think we should go with the Imaginaries. What do you think of that? And she goes, I love it. First thing I thought was, well, I need to double check and make sure that's not taken by Disney. <laughs> and you know, there's the Imagineer, yeah. which her dad still calls us the Imagineers. He hasn't figured that out yet, the Imagineries, but that's okay. <laughs> but that's how the band name came. Yeah, that's... We, we had been leading up to that. We had all these poster boards with scribbles of ideas. And I mean, we had all kinds of names. 
I don't know. I I think it's because we were working on it that it came to him. But it was definitely a divine thing that it, was. it happened that way. So can we hear the real story now? When he woke you up at 3 o'clock in the morning, did you punch him in the jaw for waking you up at 3 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> no, I was super excited because this is something that we had been toiling over for like weeks to try to figure out this name. And we were working with our branding team, our attorney, we we're asking our friends, and it got to the point where we were asking too many people. And we had all these opinions and all these thoughts. Once he said that, and honestly, I would get excited about something and then it would already be taken. So I was getting used to looking it up on this website to see if it was available. So when he told me the first thing we did, I love it. Let's look it up. And so we looked it up and there were no bands named that as far as we could tell. I actually went to sleep better that night after that, (laughs) knowing that we had a name. (laughs) You know, there's probably a Swedish band that woke up at 4 o'clock that morning that wanted that name. So, guys, it, an issue that, that Brett and I have had since the beginning of the year, you know, the whole COVID thing, we're a show about Oklahoma tourism. So everything kind of got shuttered, and it really threw us for a loop. We were... We were doing really well with the show. Everything was rolling in the direction that we expected it to. And then all of a sudden, everything is canceled. Right. How has that impacted you? You tour. You guys tour the country. As you can imagine, just like it's, you know, impacted you guys, it's it's definitely had an impact on musicians all over the world, all over the country, and definitely in Oklahoma. January and February is a slow season for musicians. There's not a lot of stuff going on. During that time, we, just like a lot of others, were booking heavily for the spring, summer, fall of 2020. We had kind of a a down period in January and February. Also, I had to get a gum surgery, which kept me from being able to sing. And during that time, we were booking shows like crazy. Our first big show was in Medicine Park on March 14th at Park Stomp. And we were really looking forward to being a part of that festival. So were we here too, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so that was our first show that was scheduled. And the very first weekend that things started getting shut down. And it was just one after another. And we've had about 25 shows get canceled for 2020. And even even outdoor shows, we've only played... I mean, three shows. about three live been a whirlwind, honestly. The few shows that we have gotten to play have been, we've been even more grateful for them. You know, it means something different now. It really does. And, you know, we've done a ton of Facebook live shows of our own and with other venues and different organizations, but there's nothing like a live performance connecting with people in person. It's had a huge impact on us. Touring is one of our main sources of income. It's been an adjustment for sure, but I think it's also forced us to figure it out another way, you know, and get creative. So as a couple of guys that really like hearing live music uh, from the other side of the stage, we we can say the same thing. It's just not the same. It's, it isn't the same. And uh we we are seriously looking forward to you guys being able to be not just you but musicians in general being able to be out there doing shows we're excited for that but with that being said with scheduling are you literally writing everything down in invisible ink because you can't commit to anything because i mean literally every time you turn on the news something new we're meeting about this we're having a we've got to have a coalition to figure out covid how are you guys planning ahead are you just kind of playing it by ear well, we're kind of looking at other things, really, at this point. I mean, we've had one show at the Guitar Sanctuary in Dallas that's been moved three times now. And I think that it's now finally in September, right? If it happens. If it happens, it may get moved a fourth time. So, I mean, I think we just kind of realized that we're just going to have to, you know, deal with that for 2020. And and one of our release strategies with the, with the Imaginary's debut album is we know that we're a brand new band. And we know that we live in a time now when it's just been so difficult to get people's attention. Um, I think the idea of people just sitting down and listening to records, I don't think that really exists so much anymore. I mean, I know there's probably people that do that, but I think that we live in a, in a society that's so busy and it's so driven on, on just go, go, go mm. that people are listening to music on the go and they're listening to singles. 
our strategy for releasing this record is, is rolling out a song at a time and each song will be accompanied with a video. And that allows the people that do discover our music to sort of get to know us and get to understand what these songs are about and, uh, and, and dive deeper into, into who we are as artists. And we're hoping that by the time next year comes and we're able to finally release the record, that we'll have sort of built up a little bit more of a following. And when we hit the road in 2021, we'll, you know, we'll have some more fans to play for. You know, I've noticed that yeah. a lot of artists, especially right now, are either dropping surprise albums or releasing albums early. And even like you said, the strategy of kind of trickling out music to kind of sprint, get us along till the album release. I'm seeing a lot of success there. Hell, I'm a victim of it. I've downloaded tons of music that way. But in, for, in terms of the release, when can we expect the debut? When's the next single yeah, going to hit? So Tell it, give us the calendar there. Just real quick, back to planning. It sure. has been really hard in general. We do have a few shows on the books for October even with contract signed. But we, like Shane said, are being really flexible as we have to be, as everyone is having to be right now. But along with releasing an album comes touring, usually. We're hoping to release the album when we can tour more. We've had to re regroup three times now with all this stuff that's been happening with the Setzer tour getting canceled, Shane getting sick with COVID. Had lots of starts and, and stops. We're looking towards early 2021 album release, but that could change. That could be sooner, depending on how things are going. But we do know that our next single, Walking on a Wire, is coming out August 14th, and we're super excited about that. Yeah, we're excited as well. Now, I do know that you guys have a locked-in date coming up real soon. Mm -hmm. The Oklahoma Food Truck Championship in Chickasha on October 3rd. There is a slight possibility yes. that we're going to be on the stage at the same time because uh, Brett and I are vying to be judges in that event. If not, nice. it's a, well, it's a contingency There's plan. A, it is a contingency plan. We are waiting for the governor and lieutenant governor to Cancel. officially decline uh, before we are moved into that position. So we're so, alternates. Just saying, come by our table. Oh. Uh, we'll sign, I don't know, we'll sign whatever you got. <laughs> just kidding. Perfect. Love it. That's awesome. Well, we, we can't wait to meet you guys. We sure hope that that show happens. We're, we're expecting to have our full band for that. And oh, that'd be good. Being outdoors and everything, I think it'll... We, our fingers are crossed that it, it'll happen. So well, good for you all having a band and not playing to a backing track for crying out loud. What what's going on with music these days? Jeez, I honestly I think it's going to happen. As far as the show goes, I think it's going to happen. Right, because in Chickasha, we're we're a stubborn bunch. Well, and we're, and, we're and, a big deal too. We're kind of a big deal. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and for backing track, yeah. we've never been a, a fans of that, honestly. Awesome. Um, even in even in the church setting where it's very common, we we do not do that, and we love to play in an organic way with organic instruments, and it's always been that way. I think it's I think that really comes from our blues bra background too, because it's like blues music is so much about improv, you know, yes. and being able to like, hey, if you feel something, you want to take a solo out another eight bars or whatever you've got the room to do it. And it's like when you're playing the track, it's like everything is exactly the same every time. There's no room for any any spark to happen. So, yeah. And this can be a question for either of you or both of you, or you can sing the answer in, Don't in, do that. <laughs> in, in some sort of harmony. But do you guys have any words of wisdom for the young person trying to break out into the music scene right now? I think the biggest thing that we've learned is don't give up and perseverance is everything. Polite persistence is everything. It's a constant daily habit of creating your own opportunities. Most everything that we've done has not been from someone calling us. Yeah. It's been from us taking that step to contact them or to put a thought out there. It comes to fruition sometimes. It's not an easy path, you know. It's probably one of the hardest things that you could do. But if you're called to do it like we are, you will find a way and just know you're not alone and that it's going to be hard. And if you know that up front and you still want to do it, there are ways to do it. You know, there's people doing it all over the world. It definitely helps when you have a good support system like we do with with each other and our 
family and our our friends, our circle for sure. Well, Shane, yeah, good luck. Go, oh, I was just gonna say, Shane, good luck following that. Uh, but Dora, <laughs> it, right, give right. Your best. Yeah. I was just gonna add a few things. I mean, I think that you have to call forth your dreams in life, you know, and uh, and put it out there with in the universe what you want. It echoes back. And I think one of the things that we've both learned at this point in our in our career and that I would tell younger people is don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to call people and get a freaking no. What did you lose from that? Did you lose anything at all? No. You're still at the exact same place you were yesterday. But guess what? Somebody might say yes. An opportunity might arise because you were willing to ask for it. So I would just say that. Ask for what you want. You know, we're in a time and that's really cool because when I started out, it wasn't so easy to find people. You can find anyone on Facebook. Mm -hmm. You can find any producer, find any songwriter, anyone you want to work with. You can probably get an email or find, even maybe even find their phone number and call them, you know, if you're really sleuthy like Maggie. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so I, that's what I would say. I would just say, don't be afraid to ask. I mean, you're going to get a lot of no's, but you got to know that up front. That, that doesn't mean that your talent isn't there. It just means that maybe somebody's too busy to work with you or whatever, but just keep pushing forward and keep asking for what you want. Every no is one step closer to a yes. I like that. So where is the best place? I know this is, I'm asking an obvious question. What's the best place to find your work? I know YouTube is loaded with you guys, but what's, where's your clearinghouse? Well, our website is imaginaryband.com. And on our website, you can find all of our other things like social media, YouTube, all that stuff. So we are Imaginaries Band on everything. So on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I think our YouTube is just the Imaginaries. We'd love to keep in touch with the listeners and, and you guys. And yeah, right now we're driving everyone to the, to the website. Awesome. I mean, you know, everybody's staying at home and being socially distant. We need something to do with our computers besides look for our exes on Facebook. I'm just, I'm not saying, <laughs> what, I was going to say that when you said you can find anybody on Facebook. And I was like, I didn't want to be creepy about it, but my exes are, I think I'm yeah. blocked. I think I'm blocked, to be honest with you. I think I'm blocked. So. You're like, oh man, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have broke up with Sarah. Uh, <laughs> I don't, well, uh, I don't know about that. I think she's, there's probably something legal. Uh, legally binding. But anyway, <laughs> no, uh, you guys are just, I love what you're doing. Your music, it may not speak to everyone, but man, it speaks. You know what I mean? You guys really hey, put it together. That. Yeah. I love, I love the sound. Like I said, the comparison, I love that bluesy sound that comes through from, from your side. And Maggie, you, when I close my eyes, sometimes I hear a little, I do hear that uh, Allison Krauss Union Station vibe. You guys just, I, I yeah. love, I love what you all are doing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so I think, much. I think it's a it's a unique juxtaposition of our two yeah. styles, and, and it works. And uh, and we're excited. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on the show. More records. Are yeah. Coming. Absolutely. But thank you so much for taking the time, reaching out, and uh, being on the show for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. So one of the things I really like about them, uh, there are. I'm looking at a list of things that I like about them. <laughs> That we didn't even mention. No, we didn't. There's a whole lot of stuff. If if you guys have the chance, just go scour their Facebook page. It is amazing to me all of the projects and all of the movies and TV shows that they've been affiliated with over the years. You know, it's I, I just want to say something. One thing I like about being in a podcast, I, we have a, a rare opportunity, not a rare opportunity, and I think... When you talk to people that are artists, you talk to people that are good at their thing, there's there's this tendency when you work, I hate to say it, for radio or for TV, to almost sound disingenuous about, oh, that's great. Tell us about the thing you do. I'm legitimately blown away. It's a real reaction. I think I said it to Shane or to either one, really. It may not be your bag. It may not be your thing. But there is no doubt there's talent there. I mean, I got nothing against cover bands, but they they write their own music. They play their own instruments. Uh, not only that, but just their attitude. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're old if, souls. If I can be, they, they do, the old soul thing is yeah. 100% accurate. It amazes me that they're as young as they are. Oh, yeah. And they've accomplished so much, but their attitude's about the whole thing. No, they can <laughs> give a lecture right. on just being positive. Oh, yeah. And there's such a, if you look through social media and you look through 
They talk about there being a moat around the White House. There's a moat around the country. We are in dire need. We are in short supply of some type of ray of sunshine, some type of a hope. And they, I mean, I don't know. I think they are agents of hope. They're enthusiastic. Yes. They're optimistic. They're looking to the future. All the things that everybody needs to be doing right now. When I was listening to them give their closing thoughts, their light at the end of the tunnels, I felt guilty. Honestly, you know what I mean? I feel like I've missed a lot of opportunity, maybe, because I'm afraid to say, hey, look at what I can do. Or afraid to hear the word no? Yes, I hate to hear the word no. And if you're listening and you know me, you know that. So <laughs> we do have some house yeah, cleaning we do. To, to discuss. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, right? your son has a surgery coming up this week. Yes, an open heart surgery. Pretty serious. Um, yes, you have the support of me and my half of the listening audience. I mean, we're we're behind you. Right. I don't know about your half of the listening audience. I don't know if I have a half. I think they just, <laughs> you know what I mean? I think they just, I'm along for the ride, and they, they just tolerate me riding in the back of the truck that you're driving. <laughs> in all seriousness, though, yeah. uh, prayers, love and light, all of that, if there's anything that you need. To help in that process, we're here for you. It has been the most absolutely uh, most difficult thing. Uh, it, it's hard enough starting over at, at, at 43, which that's not old, but to become a new parent again is a challenge within itself to have to be the parent of a child that has something as serious as uh, Tetralogy of Fallot. I'm telling you, it, it, it shook me to my core when we, when we found out, but the good news He's in great hands. The surgeon uh, is a renowned surgeon. I mean, he I think he travels between here and Houston. Everything we've heard, uh, if you look, you know, and I don't know what they call a Yelp review for a doctor, but everything we've heard is positive. So I, I think he's in good hands. Uh, it's just such a, you know, it's such an interesting time to be anywhere near anything medical right now. It's just so uncertain, but I think I think everything's going to be just fine. Well, um, like I said, you've got the prayers and hopes. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. Uh, absolutely. That will possibly have some impact on the shows over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. We're not 100% sure what what's going to come together. We have every intention of a show being released um, on schedule, mm -hmm. but it may not be what you're used to. If that's the case, hopefully you can bear with us uh, while this gets taken care of. It, it we we're creative, you know. We've been around for a while. We've been doing this for a while. We've seen this type type of thing before. But uh, yeah, rest assured, we will be back. And if you guys are a fan of what we're doing here, the only ask that w that Brett and I have mm -hmm. is that you subscribe to the show. So if you're right. listening to us now, you you like the Imaginaries, and you've come across our podcast, yeah. go ahead and go over there and hit the subscribe button. That is super helpful to us, and it'll make sure that our shows come up in your feed from here on out. But for now, we're going to leave you with a little special treat. That's right. We have some music, don't we? We do, from the Imaginaries. Right. And this has been the Only an OK Show. I am Harley. And I am Brett. And we're out of here. Peace. <laughs> Yeah.